Good morning, Honors Physics. This is Mr. Hausman. Uh, we are starting with uh, something a little more practical or something a little bit more tangible having to do with circuits. Uh, we're going to be working on identifying circuit components, circuit parts. Um, so you're seeing page 10 of our circuit packet. Uh, you can choose to do handwritten notes. You can choose to just analyze this image because really this is actually kind of a thinking exercise. And, uh, and then we're gonna connect what's on page 10 and 11 to what you see here on this device. This device is called a breadboard and uh, this would be the time that I would have introduced it to you in class, how to set up um, circuits. Um, they're quite miniature. As you can see, these wires are very small. The power supplies plug in here, but we'll actually go through a little bit of what how this is set up. Uh, and uh, this is a, a power supply just plugged into my, to my wall outlet. Uh, so let's get started actually, believe it or not, on page uh, 10 in the main, uh, in the main packet. So it says lab techniques. Um, we would have uh, had the chance to take out a multimeter, a single resistor. We'll worry about what that is in just a minute. And we would have learned how to use this device. Uh, this device is a multimeter. You'll see them in future videos that I'll make. Uh, a multimeter has the capacity for measuring lots of quantities like voltage, like current, like resistance. Uh, and, and then on this side, this is alternating uh, voltage, AC voltage, uh, alternating current, uh, and um, capacitance and, and farads. So we won't even get to farads in honors physics, but we would have been using quite a few of the settings on this multimeter. So let's begin. So some of you have already figured out that when you happen to be calculating uh, a, uh, an unknown resistance, let's grab our uh, pencil tool, Seems to be misbehaving this morning. Oh no, I don't want to have to stop and redo. Let's go back to, there we go. Let's see if the pencil recognizes, great, okay. So let's, uh, let's grab a pen, there we go. So you've already figured out that if resistance is an unknown, and sometimes in circuits, um, resistors have to be identified. Uh, what is the resistance of this resistor? Well, what you can do is you could, of course, apply a voltage to the circuit, a potential difference, and measure the current going through it. Uh, there's dedicated voltmeters, there's dedicated um, ammeters, an ammeter, right? This is measured in amps, this is measured in volts, but the ir irony is that you would measure it with an ammeter, not an amp meter, but the proper name for it would be an ammeter. Uh, and this would be just called a voltmeter. So if you, measured the current that you got, and of course uh, took voltage and divided by current, you would get resistance. But the problem is there are very small fluctuations in readings. Uh, the other th reality is that when we look at a power supply, and this one is adjustable, but it says it's three volts, guess what? It's not exactly three volts. There are incredibly expensive power supplies that have very um, uh, um, basically exact voltage outputs, but for a typical system, believe it or not, even your computer, you get what's called a nominal three volt. It's a, a, on average, it's three volts. It can be up or down. So what happens if your voltage is too high, you know, and your current is measured too low, well, you're gonna get an incorrect reading for your resistor. So the best way to get resistance is to get many voltage readings and plot them on an X axis. And every time you adjust the voltage, you would slide this from three up to maybe 4.5 and see, and then take a new reading with your, with your ammeter. And again, some of these things um, aren't uh, visible right now, uh, but uh, the point is, is you get a bunch of voltage and current data. And every time you measure that voltage, you, uh, you change the voltage, you measure the current. Well, if you plot those V on the Y axis and I and current on the X axis, you're gonna get for most metals, for most circuits, you're gonna get a linear relationship. Uh, in fact, if it's linear, then the material is said to be ohmic. That is to say, it satisfies Ohm's law. Uh, if, on the other hand, it does not stay linear, if this pattern 
curved, and many materials do. Uh, for example, batteries themselves, uh, the higher voltage you push, try to push through a battery, it will not always give you an increasing current that's directly proportional. So this page is really about, could you find the resistance of this uh, circuit? This is data. Uh, the problem is, look at this graph. Uh, this one uh, is kind of reversed. So if you were to plot current, right, I over here and voltage here, and you know that slope is always the y-axis over x, well, according to, if you tried to find slope here, you'd get I over V, that is not R. Here, the resistance would be one over M on this graph. So if you found the slope, and I, I don't doubt that you could do it. In fact, take a look at this, guys. It looks like it's 0.1 for every one on the Y. So that's a uh, 0.1 for every one or a resistance, uh, sorry, a slope of 0.1, and the reciprocal of 0.1, 1 tenth is 10. So the, the slope for this graph, see if you can rewind that if you need to figure that out again, but the slope would be 0.1, but because the resistance equals one over the slope, what's the reciprocal of 0.1? The resistance equals 10 ohms. And on this graph, if you were to use software, of course, curve fitting, linear curve fitting would be your friend, right? There was, that's built into Excel. So in this case, the quantity that comes in front of X, because it's using the, the slope intercept form of the equation, and of course, the coefficient in front of X in the slope intercept form is also the slope. So let's look at this graph, this second one. And you notice that voltage is now on the Y, current is on the X. That's quote unquote the correct way to do it because now your uh, Y is equal to volts, your X is equal to amps, and that is the ratio that gives us ohms, right, or resistance. So here, the slope being, if the slope is 3.11, then the resistance equals 3.11 ohms. So it was meant to be something that you could actually experiment with, and we would have made our own table by changing the voltage, uh, and you would have experimentally found what is the resistance of this uh, of that resistor. Okay, uh, we will still be able to get to do some lab things like that, or at least simulate them. Let's go to page 11. Uh, so here we go. Um, this is where like all the theory becomes practical. And for any of you who have hands-on experience with circuits, that's great, but it's not required. So what is a circuit? Well, a circuit we've all heard of probably in a previous science class. Uh, it probably had a bulb in it. It maybe had a motor in it. Maybe you did more fancy things with solar panels, but it is nothing more than a closed loop. Uh, it has no gaps in it at all. So the wires are connected from battery to the bulb, from the bulb back to the battery, no loose connections, right? Sometimes light bulbs have to be threaded into a connector. That's also a place where you could open the loop and it wouldn't work. Now, some of you know that, that there is a circuit type called an open circuit. And that might've been a middle school idea, which is great. Uh, you open the switch. And the, I guess that's important, but the reality is it has, there's no physics to it. It's just a switch that is not yet closed. So there's no, there's no mathematical relationships. Uh, certainly it's very practical. We want to be able to turn off our lights. Here's what I found. Sorry, Siri's interrupting us. Uh, the flow of current in a closed pass under the influence of a driving blank. Okay, so you have to have a closed loop. Uh, we'll talk about all the things you have to have besides a closed loop. But the key idea here is that there has to be a potential difference. It is required to have a potential difference, but remember there's a much easier synonym for that called a voltage difference or a voltage. What is the voltage of this battery? Really, what is the delta V of this battery? Because that's the driving influence of the whole circuit. Without it, you can have bulbs, you can have wires, you can have other components, but if you don't have a power supply, sometimes we call it that, a potential difference, there's gonna be no energy or no push. So batteries provide the push, the electrical pressure 
in the form of an energy or potential difference. Um, there must be a closed conducting, notice it says conductor, closed conducting path. Charges in the circuit. So if you go to the microscopic level, we're talking about electrons in this wire. And they are what's carrying the energy from the battery. That's basically uh, the dominoes that are moving the energy through. They're all lined up. And the point is, is that the charges, uh, the charge does not ever get used up. You don't destroy any electrons. So we talk about my phone is not charged. Oh, I better put some charges back into it. Not really. Maybe some electrons go back into a, a rechargeable electronic device, but in reality, what you're really putting back in is energy, not charges. We just, I don't know, we use the word um, charging my device and you're not charging it, you're energizing it, but that just doesn't flow. So charges in a circuit drift, remember they are not going at the speed of light. The electric field moves at the speed of light. Uh, the moment you turn it on, the light goes on instantly, but the electrons flow quite slowly uh, because of the E field that's in the wire. As, a, as the charges move through the circuit, energy is transformed. And the, it's the energy from the battery, the potential energy uh, from the, uh, the energy difference, and it turns into something like light, heat, sound, or of course, any kind of mechanical energy, motion, rotation, spinning, uh, driving. So uh, there's lots of motors that can do that, right? You get light from a light bulb, that's obvious. Heat, believe it or not, the most common way to get heat out of a circuit, if you're trying to make something that warms you up, is you actually put in a piece of metal that is not a very good conductor. They'll use um, metals that have lower um, resistance, uh, higher resistance uh, than like a copper metal. Uh, you can also build them, and I'm look at, look at the small picture on your screen, from ceramics. This ceramic has some metal embedded in it, and it controls the flow. This little tiny thing, and I know it looks like, you know, you can barely see it. My camera, I can zoom in a little bit. There it is. It looks like a tiny little uh, uh, light blue um, uh, kind of bulb or like bulge on the wire, right? It's a little fatter than the wire and it's got some stripes on it and we will talk about those stripes. Okay, so uh, now we're gonna learn how to do schematics. Schematics are nothing more than this basically drawing pattern, uh, rules for drawing circuits uh, that everyone who's describing circuits uh, abides by. So first off, you can draw cartoons like this, but the reality is, is that for a schematic, all lines are straight. And ironically, by boxing it with my pencil, that is, uh, those are my straight lines, right? So no connection ever curves. They always uh, bend, uh, go straight or bend 90 degrees, uh, perpendicular or 90 degree corners. And essentially, yeah, this isn't really a rule, but you can put things together in any way uh, possible. And we're gonna be doing that a little bit later. Um, so let's start with the most common schematic elements. So when you're drawing a battery, the power supply, the energy supply, the pusher, it's nothing more than two vertical lines, uh, or they can be horizontal. Batteries can be drawn either way, but it's a long line and a short line separated. The long line represents high potential. The short line represents low potential. And then you connect it to your circuit. And these are the leads. So essentially, the key idea here is that it's two parallel lines drawn really closely. Now, you may see someday where they're drawn long, short, long, short. Well, this is also sometimes called a, a cell. Uh, like uh, a battery is made of a cell. So this is a one cell battery. But uh, in a um, laptop, they are not uncommon to find four cell batteries where there's essentially four batteries that could be separated, but they each provide their own voltage. And when you do that and you connect batteries in series like this, and then all the nubs, all the positive ends have to face the same way, there's a little rule that says that your voltages add up. So V1 plus V2. Uh, that's assuming they're pointing in the correct direction. So a battery is just two parallel lines. Uh, a wire is nothing more than right a line. 
uh, straight line, never bends, right? It always, when I say never bends, it never curves. It can only bend 90 degrees. Light bulbs like these guys, and I have another small one, look on the small screen, uh, of course, like a holiday light. And inside, if you've never looked inside a, a light bulb, I'm not sure why you would have, and yet I can't really zoom in and see that. There's a filament. There's a piece of tungsten wire that glows red hot uh, inside that bulb. And uh, it's good that this uh, bulb is uh, sealed. You notice that this little pointy shape isn't just decorative. Uh, it's to seal off this tungsten from oxygen because if this tube was open, the tungsten wire, that's an element on the periodic table, you probably, you may not remember. It's got a fun symbol if you want to look it up uh, because of its name from another language. But it basically has to be uh, sealed off from oxygen. If this glass was cracked, that wire would almost instantly burn in the presence of oxygen once current was running through it. So there's this kind of bulb. There's the kind that thread into uh, like a socket. But the symbol we always use is uh, right the bulb. The, think of this as that's the glass part. And here's the filament. So we do a loop inside and then we connect that to the wire. So light bulbs, little circle with a loop in it. Resistors are wiggle waggles. They look like kind of like a rough bumpy road because that's what resistors do. Look at the small video and this resistor is kind of like uh, if I was sending electrons through this path, the rough road would slow down my progress. And that's what a resistor does. It provides friction. So look how rough it is. There is no exact number of wiggle waggles you have to draw. Um, when I hand draw, I just do it a few times and then I move on. But it's usually, do you notice it's labeled? It'll say R uh, or it'll say 10 or 20. Well, there's actually any amount of uh, resistance that you can have from um, milli ohms to kilo ohms to mega ohms, but you always put in the resistance right next to the resistor. Okay, then there's switches, open and closed. And then there's this thing called a diode. Diodes are flow control valves. They only allow the electricity to flow one way and guess which way they flow according to the drawing. Yeah, they, they only flow this way. If the current was reversed, it would stop. It would, it would abruptly stop the circuit. And there's a reason why we might want that, especially when it comes to what's called alternating current, where the current can flow in uh, uh, alternating directions. So I bet a lot of you have heard of LEDs, light emitting diodes. And a light emitting diode is a diode that has been specially engineered to control the flow. And when the flow is going in the quote unquote correct direction, it will give off some light. And they look a lot like this. Let's see this one. Let's see which one will show up best on camera. Uh, a little red diode. Okay, so it just looks like a little tiny lamp. You might put in a little mini flashlight. Do you notice that the legs though are not the same length, those two wires? Well, that has to do with the fact that if you put this in the, the path of the electricity, the long side, right, is expecting the higher voltage. And there's a way of bending these so that it's used kind of like uniformly. Oops, especially when you throw it around. One more time. There we go. This is the correct way to bend the legs so that they eventually have the same length, but the long side has to go to the high potential side. If you accidentally put the high voltage here, two things can happen. Depending on the construction of the bulb, you may burn out the bulb because you're sending the electricity this way through the circuit. You know, it goes in one wire and back, and it was never designed for that, so it can damage your LED. Students notoriously do that the first time they use them, or the proper way, which is long side um, is on the high side. Okay, so those are the major features of circuits. Uh, this is again a little cartoon of one uh, of an LED. You just saw one live. Here's a resistor, that little ceramic piece I showed you, and then meters. So if you go to page 12, this couldn't be any easier. Can you label some of the components uh, of this circuit? So hit pause, uh, look at page 12, see if you can't label all the parts, and then we'll check.
Okay, so we're back now. So on uh, schematic number one, we have two batteries. They're in series with each other because notice they're in, oriented in the correct direction with the high potential here, right? And the low potential on the bottom side. Then we have a bulb, a regular incandescent bulb with a, with a filament. We've got bulb two. We of course have conducting wires. It says you don't have to label those, um, but at least one place. Here we have an open switch. Okay, schematic two, what do you say? I say we have a single battery. We don't know its voltage or its potential difference, but one battery. We have one resistor. It's not labeled. Uh, had I labeled it with like 10 ohms, it would have just been maybe so obvious. So there's your resistor. Here's your LED, your light emitting diode. And here's your open switch. And finally, this is a, a new configuration that we kind of haven't even heard about yet. Uh, we have, of course, a battery on the left-hand side. And then we have what are called parallel pathways. So remember the electrons are carrying the energy and they're all lined up in this wire. Well, these are called nodes. Um, not really in a truly electrical engineering or physics way, but we're gonna call those junctions or nodes where the electrons have, uh, have two options. They either go straight or they curve. And then they have, again, um, the opportunity to go either straight or curve. Or on this last, that's not really a node, that's just a bend in the wire. So um, junctions create parallel circuits. Well, this one's, oops, spell that right. And then of course you have resistors and we would number these resistors, maybe number one, R2 and R3. They could be different or they could be the same as each other. So labeling and recognizing these symbols isn't too bad. Okay, so uh, one of the last major ideas here is going to be about energy in a circuit. And this is a pretty big one um, before we do something with these. So remember we said that energy is conserved, but it has to be transformed. The total energy of the battery has to go somewhere, but it usually does not go back to the battery. In fact, if your potential energy, your electrical potential energy goes back to the battery, that's dangerous. That is going to be called a short circuit. Now, some people think that a short circuit is when the circuit is open. Uh, that is to say there's a switch open or maybe there's a cut in the wire. N no, actually what happens with a short circuit is that there is no load. So a short circuit is when there is no opportunity for the electrons to give their energy, to, to turn it into heat or light or mechanical energy or anything else. And so that's incredibly dangerous because the energy is going back to the battery, but that's not how you recharge it. Uh, it would actually destroy the battery, maybe cause heat, if not cause a fire. So short circuits with no load, no, no light bulb or no resistor, uh, you just don't make them. They're, they're dangerous. Okay, so here's a drawing of a circuit. Can you see what's in there? That's not maybe a true schematic, but it has three batteries and three bulbs, and they happen to be in series, meaning they're one after the other, right? An electron that go, gets pushed by the battery would go through the first bulb, through the second bulb, through the third, and then back to the battery to get more energy. And so you turn that into a proper schematic where your resistor, your bulbs can be drawn into resistors. And that's a weird trick. A light bulb is, is really giving off light, but it's acting as a resistor. You can find the resistance of a light bulb based on how much energy it drops off. So that's the key idea. Anytime you have a load, a light bulb, a motor, or a resistor, just to name a few, some of those devices that convert potential energy into heat or light, there is a change in the voltage that is different than the battery's voltage. So let's look over here, right there in fine print. It says all of these batteries stacked up together. There must be a lot of them. Uh, one, two, three, four, five, I see six. So maybe it's six uh, AA batteries and they add up to the total voltage is 12 volts. So what we do is we think of this as a waterfall. 
the total energy that comes out of the battery has to be 12 volts. We call that the high voltage. So picture a waterfall up in the air. And when it comes back to the battery, it has to be zero volts. That is to say, how much energy uh, are they changing, right? So that's the electric field. There's a difference in the different places. So what you notice is that the first resistor is losing negative three volts. So it's falling. So every load, every bulb, every resistor loses energy in the form of light or heat. Well, the second resistor here loses seven. So this is negative three, negative seven volts. And then the last one is uh, negative two volts. And if you notice, those add up to negative 12. They always have to add up. So if you have three resistors in series, they don't have to be the same. But what you notice is that the potential energy that drops here plus the potential energy that drops here plus the potential energy per charge that drops here, we refer to that as the voltage. And we're going to call it voltage one, voltage two, voltage three. Well, what happens is they have to equal the delta V for the entire electric field or for the entire voltage source. Okay, so um, let's kind of notice what happens here. Uh, we have a total of nine volts on the high voltage side, zero volts here. So when a charge comes out, well, across wire BC. So let's look at this really carefully. This is a detail I haven't explained. If you were to use the multimeter, remember that device I showed you, but I didn't have the wires for because I didn't prepare perfectly. So this multimeter, if we searched and we measured how much voltage we dropped, oops, I'm zoomed in way too far. And so we put it on voltage setting, either the two or the 20, we'll learn why. And you measured how much voltage dropped between B and C. Well, B is the battery terminal. C is where the wire makes contact with the motor. And the answer would be from B to C, there would be no loss of energy. In a wire, right, wires have no delta V. If they are short and uh, if there isn't a heavy load on them. I guarantee some of you may go into fields where you find out that no, wires can affect the voltage. But we're going to say short wires in, in principle, in theory, do not lose voltage. They are not part of the load. Then it says, what is the potential difference across C to D? Well, I happen to know that C to D, since there's only one motor in the circuit, and that's the symbol for a motor, and the total voltage of the circuit is nine volts, that I happen to know that the voltage drop from C to D, right, has to be nine volts. So from C to D is nine volts. Then from D to uh, A, there's a zero volt drop, right? The voltage doesn't change in a wire. So there's a wire here and a wire here, and there's no voltage drop. So do you kind of get how this graph works? This shows you from different positions where on the graph, and then uh, by the way, A to B, right? Isn't the battery re giving the uh, charges more energy? That's the purpose of the battery power supply. Let's go to the next one and see if you can't figure it out. See if you can draw in or at least conceive. Um, if these are two identical motors, both in series, and it starts off nine volts on one side, zero volts on the other side of the battery, how much energy would you lose or gain depending on where you are? So let's do the battery first, A to B. Well, the electrons are gonna get their energy, their voltage boosted back up to nine volts. The electrons that carry the energy, they're fully, they're coming out of B at nine volts. B to C is just a wire, right? The wire or the conductor doesn't lose any voltage. So it stays nine volts. C to D. Well, here's how it works. If we said, mo you know, the previous motor, you know, went from nine to zero. But if you go from nine to zero, then there's no energy left for motor one. Uh, motor one and that would mean that like kind of the, the energy is not being conserved. You're using it up too soon. So what happens is 
you use half the voltage if the motors are identical. So notice it dropped to 4.5. Now E to D is another wire. That's a lead, that's a conductor. No energy drop between D to E. And then E to F would be the other 4.5 volt drop. So there's a delta V here of 4.5 and there's a delta V here. Did you notice what I just did? Instead of calling them negative, we're just going to measure the delta V um, as positive quantities, right? The total drop has to be nine, whoops, nine volts. And so there has to be two drops of 4.5. And then to finish this off, F back to A, yet another wire, a conductor, so no voltage drop. So tracking energy in a circuit is going to be able to help you analyze circuits going forward. Okay. This is part of your, uh, your assignment for today, as well as an online lab. So there's activity one and activity two, and we'll see how these work. You're, gonna want, you're probably gonna wanna print this page. Page 14 is pretty critical. Um, and yeah, we will save that one for the next lesson. Sorry, just looking ahead. So according to this, it says, could you color code the wires according to voltage? Wait a minute, he hasn't talked about that yet, so I don't know what he means. Well, I see, a high voltage potential from the long line coming out of the battery. And so what we're gonna use is we're gonna use colors that are like hot, reds and pinks, to represent the highest energy or the highest voltage the electrons can have. Energy, again, per charge. So what you basically say is if this is a nine volt battery, all of the electrons are carrying, right, nine joules per coulomb, and they're high energy all the way until they get to the first load. Now that little device, we don't know what it is. It could be a light bulb, it could be a resistor, but it's gonna take some of the energy. And so we're gonna go to a color that's a little bit less, um, if you will, energetic uh, or like bright. And I would ideally use orange. I'm not sure if I have that capability. So I'm gonna go to what's a, uh, a color that's a little cooler than red hot. We're going to go with yellow. Again, I would have preferred orange, but I can't quite seem to make my, my pencil do that. You could do orange. That's kind of orangey. Now, there's going to be another loss of energy here, right? There's going to be a delta V here, um, and there's a delta V here. And what would be a temperature, again, going down the rainbow from the reds and the oranges and the yellows? Oh, how about green? Because red, orange, yellow, green shows that you've lost some energy. And notice it always happens across the resistor. This little carrot or this little tent is showing that there's a drop there, like a waterfall. And as a standard, what we're gonna use is we're gonna use that the final um, uh, kind of energy or voltage is always should be going back to the battery as zero volts. And we're gonna make that cool and we're gonna make that blue. So blue is, uh, let's not talk about flame color, but let's kind of talk about the warmth of the color in like an art sense. So red is hot and high voltage, orange middle, green a little bit less, and blue coming back cold or low energy. So if you tried that for each of these, you're gonna notice uh, some kind of patterns emerge. And maybe with some practice, you'll get the hang of this. Let's do one more. High energy coming out of the bulb, right? High voltage. Okay, now every single electron goes through that first resistor. And so therefore we've got to go to a medium color temperature. And the wires never change the color, right? The, the junctions, the nodes, they don't change the color. But what we see is that, right, now we have to, we have two options. We either go through uh, this resistor or this resistor or that light bulb, but each time it lowers our energy. So let me show you how to work backwards when you have more complicated systems. So if this is blue, because it comes back zero volts or low voltage, what color did we use previously between orange and blue? Green, because every single electron that came through this resistor has to go back toward the battery. Current can't flow backwards. Current always flows, let me use my laser pointer, in one direction, right? It either goes through this loop or it goes through the outer loop, but it never goes down here and then decides to go against the current. Uh, because the current was flowing, and let me use uh, a color that's uh, not any of these uh, color, colorful ones, let's use black. 
right? The current was flowing this way because that's the direction of high potential from the battery. And it either goes this way or comes out this way. So there's no going against the current for charges, uh, at least not in a direct current battery. So what are you left with? Well, what you're left with is you notice that this green, right, that's here, as long as you don't go through a resistor, the voltage doesn't change. And now we're left with kind of a, a challenge. We, we need another color. And if you had color pens or colored pencils uh, or crayons, um, you could do it much more easily. So hopefully I'm not um, making this too, too challenging. Uh, and again, I do not see the ability to get a color, you know, that's orange or in between. Maybe I'm not sure how to use my software. Um, oop, I can do custom colors. So I'm going to take some things back. Let's see if I can't get a better orange. There we go. Watch this. I'm sorry I'm doing it backwards. There's my orange. And that allows me to have what's an intermediate color between orange and green go through the rainbow. Red, orange, yellow. And I know that should be more orange. I, I picked a, a, a browner orange um, from my palette. So your challenge here is to color code the voltages from high to low. Uh, and uh, again, or from low to high, you might want to work both directions. Um, and the other thing to notice for is, is there any place where there's a pathway, right, that does not go through a resistor? I'll give you a hint, right? We have our first short circuit. Uh, it, that actually is safe though, but it is shorting out one of the circuits. So watch out, right? And we call a short circuit basically and the, um, the path of least resistance or the easy way out. So read the instructions, try page uh, number, oops, I can't see, this is page number 13. There we go uh, for your work today.